Now, Downing Street has been forced to rule out plans for conscripting the army after the head of the army yesterday warned that British civilians would need to fight Russia in a future war. It's a citizen's army he's talking about, volunteers. Joining me now to discuss this is former Armed Forces Minister Lord Andrew Robertson. And, of course, Chris Parry is still with us. He's a former NATO and Royal Navy commander. I'm surrounded, surrounded by alpha males who've actually done a proper day's work in their lives. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Lord Robertson. Hello. Can you, can you hear um, me? Can, can you I just hear? say hello to Chris Parry, who took me to South Georgia on HMS York, I think it was, 35 years ago. Hello, I'm not Andrew. sure that makes me an alpha male, though. We're having a little reunion. I'm loving this. Andrew, this is... yeah, we are. Uh, yeah. Andrew, I remember you jumping over rows of elephant seals. You're definitely an alpha male. <laughs> what's going <laughs> on? What's just happened? I don't know what's <laughs> going on here. I've lost all control. Anyway, I was not there. I was not a witness. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. I do want to talk also about the post office because she plays a really cru crucial role in that. But um, what did you make? Just first of all, what did you make of, of what the, the head of the army had to say? General Sir Patrick uh, Sanders, again, also Chris Barry knows, I'm sure you do as well, Lord Robertson, saying that the UK needed a military that could not only expand rapidly but, could also, but also had to train and equip a citizen army uh, in a speech he made yesterday. Today. Do you think he's right? Uh, of course he's right. And um, we are in a hugely dangerous time, uh, not just in Ukraine, but what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in the Red Sea. Uh, Iran is, is not a friend of ours. Um, we should be absolutely aware that we need to bolster our defences. And I'm afraid, whilst I hate to say it, this government needs to realise it has to spend money on defence now, not in 10 years' time. We need to bolster our navy, we need to have more aircraft, and we need many more troops. That's not to cut out things like modern uh, drones, but we have to have better defences. You have defences to deter aggression, and if you haven't got defences, people sense weakness and they then attack you. And this, your interests. this is the key thing, isn't it? A lot of people are saying, well, you know, building up the armed forces, talking about this, this is warmongering, this is people wanting to go to war, but as we've been discussing all morning, the best way of avoiding going to war is speak softly and carry a big stick. As a former US president had to say, your willingness and your ability to wage war is what will act as the best defence against being attacked and having to fight a war. Well, I grew up in the Cold War. I served in Germany in the Cold War are 55,000 troops all pointing their guns to the east for what deterred the Warsaw Pact invading across the inner German border. And we need to understand that, that, that without defence, you are weak, you are liable to, your interests are liable to be attacked, and we will all be the poorer. Uh, when I was at school, I remember the Territorial Army was perhaps not very efficient, but it was a quarter of a million strong. Well, I'm afraid that was something that you could grow an army on. You can't do that anymore because our reserves are pitifully small. Our army itself, for instance, which I know more about than anything else, is going down to 72, 73,000. This is pathetic. I mean, it, it, is, it is pretty pathetic, isn't it? I mean, it, the numbers are, are risible uh, compared to yeah. many other countries. And we know a lot of other countries around Europe, those who perhaps have more of an understanding of what it's like to be invaded by, uh, invaded by Russia, it's happened to them in living memory. Uh, they do actually have, you know, conscription, even if it's for national service, it doesn't have to be in the military, but some sort of uh, national service of some sort. We, we kind of, fight, sort of shy away from that. We've, I think we've had a... Our uh, army, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and only 25 of those years it's ever had actually enforced conscription and only actually in, in moments of war. But do you think we need to perhaps think differently? I think we need to think differently, but I don't think we need conscription. We might, of course, one day. Uh, the question is whether or not the British people... I think this is what Patrick Sanders, who, who I really rate, was trying to say. Patrick Sanders, I think, was trying to say that we need to change the mindset of the British people to understand that one day they may be required to stand up and fight for their country. And I'm afraid if you were in Ukraine, this would not be a controversial yeah. thing to say at all. Um, or indeed, if you're in the Baltic states or, or some of the Eastern European states. I mean, this is the interesting thing is that, you know, I mean, men were banned from leaving the country in Ukraine. Women and children, as you know, many of them uh, fled to, yeah. uh, uh, to Poland and, 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 of course, we have many, and Germany and many of them have come here to the UK. But men were, you know, banned from leaving the country. They were told you have to go and fight on the front line for your country. Um, now, we have seen more and more men have been able to leave the country. I, I asked yesterday our, our audience, you know, would you be willing to fight for your country? I've got to be honest, I was quite shocked by how many people just said no. And even people ex-military themselves say, I wouldn't fight for our country. I feel that we've been betrayed by this government. And I said, well, yeah, I, I wouldn't see it as fighting for the government. I'd see it as fighting for our friends, our families, our loved ones, our values. But a lot of people feel that 
and, and I think there's a valid point here that they don't know what they'd be fighting for or fighting this. What are our values? What do we stand for? When people have been told for years and years, this is a terrible country, it's a racist country, it's got a terrible past, uh, you know, slavery, and you, I mean, we're just a horrible, awful, evil country. It's what a surprise that particularly young people will feel it's not worth fighting for. Well, Julia, I agree 100% with you, of course. Um, I'm afraid our education system has a lot to answer for. Uh, I am proud of my country, as I hope all my family are proud of our country. Yes, of course, there are some bad things that happened in the past, but frankly, we're a pretty good country. That's why, by the way, hundreds of thousands of people want to come here every year to live, because it's a great place to live. So I think, I think we should get over that. I think we should get over all this, which we'll describe as woke nonsense, um, <laughs> and stand up for what is actually right. And I'm afraid you can, I mean, just to see people marching, hundreds of thousands of people marching the streets of London uh, in support of a terrorist organization that's committed mass murder of Jews, I find not just distasteful, I find it absolutely abhorrent. Uh, and I think we need to get that across. Most people in this country, I believe, are still proud of this country, but I do understand they're somewhat confused by uh, what has been happening over the last few decades. Yeah, indeed. I agree with you. I think most people are, I meet are, but I understand why people, you know, have been basically, I mean, especially our young people, told not to be. Can I also ask you, as a, as a Conservative peer, about, well, we know where we are with uh, the Tory leadership. Uh, we've been talking today about, you know, the latest announcement on how to tackle knife crime from both sides, Labour and the Tories. And I think largely people are going, oh, yeah, this again, they won't make any difference. We've got the latest crime stats showing knife crime's actually gone up, robberies have gone up. People just don't believe anything that any politician says anymore. But we've had quite a lot of criticism of Rishi Sunak. We had uh, one of his own former colleagues, uh, Sir Simon Clark, uh, worked with him as his deputy when he was in the Treasury, saying, look, you know, you're not up to the job. Um, you know, we we're going to face electric, electric, electoral annihilation. So, you know, we just, you know, we need to get rid of you, have a leadership election within a week, which would mean obviously the party members don't get a say, um, and, and we need to try something new. Um, do you think there's any validity um, in that? Well, I think I was uh, um, in the House of Commons in 1996-7, uh, which was not a good time. Um, <laughs> Understatement. I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the... Um, the idea of a leadership election now is for the birds. It's, it's completely absurd. If there were an outstanding candidate hanging around who would be brought forward, that might be something different. Um, but actually, to have another leadership election would make the Conservative Party look ridiculous. And it's not looking great at the moment, but it would make us look absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Rishi Sunak is a very decent, extremely intelligent, very able man. I think he's not connecting with the British people, as he might, uh, because they want inspiration, an inspirational, passionate leadership. But he's a very good man, and uh, I think I, he's doing. I think he's doing a good job. Well, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the last sentence, but I agree with you. I, I've, I've met him a number of times, and I, I've no reason to think any of that is untrue. I think, I think a lot of those things. But again, people do want a bit of inspiration, and they want someone they feel has got firm beliefs. They know what they want to do. They, they're in politics to do something, to achieve something. You know, um, and 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 people tend to like politicians who. Who they feel, you know, actually, you know, are there with the drive, with the mission. And I know, I know, like there are people who divide people, like Nigel Farage. But you know, at least you knew what you wanted to do. You knew what the, you know, what the aim was. And there are lots of politicians I, I fundamentally disagree with, but at least I know what they stand for. That's the thing. No one really knows what he stands for. Like he says, oh, he's going to stand up on trans ideology in our schools, but then doesn't really do it. He's going to stand up on this issue, but then doesn't really do it. You, at the end of the day, after 14 years in power. Uh, and I know he's not been the Prime Minister, even in a high level of government for most of that, but people are saying, you've got to, at some point, show us what you've done, not what you're, say you're, you're saying you're going to do. Um, well, I think uh, I wouldn't disagree with a lot you've said. Um, mm. I, I, one should understand that the business of government is very difficult, not least because within the party, every party is a coalition, within the party there are some people that take different views to others, um, as we've seen quite graphically recently. Um, I personally um, um, tend to be on the hard hard side. And for instance, I, I think the situation with immigration is, is, is unsupportable for all sorts of sensible reasons. Um, we, need, we do need to show some inspiration and some passion and some belief. And I think Rishi can do it, although uh, time is pretty short. Um, I'm afraid the truth is that for the last seven or eight years, uh, post-Brexit, we've looked a, a bit shambolic. 
I, I think it's fair to say. I, I, that's and, an uh, understatement. I think, I think we'll all agree. Let's end on that note of agreement. Uh, Lord Robeson, thank you very much. Andrew Robeson, he's a former Armed Forces Minister. Thank you for that. Chris